I am thrilled that I could come by and see y'all. I believe God is moving in this area. I felt the Spirit of the Lord, uh, you know, during the service. So far, I felt fluctuating between teaching and prophecy, teaching and prophecy. I said, Lord, you better stop this because I'm about to explode, you know, teaching and prophecy. And, but he didn't give me one scripture he wanted me to read to you. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll see. We'll just see what we're willing to hear. That's really what's important tonight. The Holy Spirit's got all kinds of stuff to say. Amen. And the hard part is, is that we, we kind of like to pigeonhole God in our box. You know, if I was from Florida, for example, I'd like a Florida God. And if I was from New York, I'd like a New York God. And, you know, I'd it'd change the vehicle I was driving for which place I was. You understand? All that stuff, and God's got nothing to do with that. All God's words are true, but not all God's words are equal. Can I say that again for you? All God's words are true, but not all God's words are equal. I'll give you an example. He told Abraham to take his son out and kill him on the mountain. He's not telling you to go kill your son on the mountain. Right? Right? Does everybody agree with that? Amen. Really? Do you really? I, I haven't got to my scripture yet, but do you agree with that? Can you, can you stay with me this long? Okay, good. Because it's important to realize that all God's words are true, but not all God's words are equal. God gave an old covenant, and God gave a new covenant. Do you think you're in both? No, you know, I know this church, so I know. You know you're in a new covenant, right? The, the new completed the old, so therefore you don't need the old other than it's a history lesson. Oh, stay with me. Don't get mad at me. All God's words are true, but not all God's words are equal. You can't beat God up with the Bible and say, I want you to do it this way. He'll go, hey, I'm God. I, I do this my way. Uh, and he really is. He is the present truth word of God. He is the ever-flowing God that's coming out of you today, if you will, but hear his voice. The problem is, is that a lot of times we've been taught Christianity where you just got to know his word. Well, you'll die that way. Yep. Knowing the word of God will just allow you to just drown. Because you have to hear the word of the Lord for you today. You don't have to hear the words of God about your promises and your blessings and how wonderful you are. How tall are you, brother? 5'7"? So like me, you're never going to make 5'8", are you? You get it? No matter what we want, what is is what is. When God speaks to you and the present truth voice of the Lord comes to you, you is what you is. And God is happy with who you is. He's not mad that you're not six foot tall. He's not mad that you're not in some other church somewhere. He's not trying to get you to some other church. He's trying to let you hear the word, the present truth word of the Lord here. Amen. And he's trying not to use your pastor. Amen. Because what good is it if you have a guy that teaches real well and a bunch of people that can't even find the door to get out of the parking lot? You understand? You have to learn how to hear the present truth word of God for yourself. Amen. If you can't hear the present word, you're a dummy. I use the word stupid, and people on Facebook just went nuts on me. How can you use words? I'm Canadian. I can use whatever word works. If it got your attention, it worked. But seriously, if your pastor knows something and you don't know something, then he hasn't done his job right. His job is to get underneath you, not over top of you, and serve you till you, it becomes automatic for you to seek the present truth word of God. The nature of God will come out when you seek the present truth word of God. You know how I know that? Because we don't know the present truth word of God. I can tell you every scripture there is in the Bible. That doesn't mean I know what the present truth word of God is. I have to shut up for a minute and listen. That's the hardest thing in the world for me to do. Isn't it? Isn't it? The bridge is falling. The bridge is falling. I got to get him to fix it. You know, God goes, why don't you just shut up for a minute? He says that to me, so it's okay. This is the angle I wanted to come at this lesson with because it's real short. But the idea is that if we don't understand our nature, we will try to be a people of the book. That's what the enemies of the Jews and uh, the Christians, they, they say, the, people, the Muslims say, you're people of the book because we all have a book, a Bible, you know what I mean? And unfortunately, it's true. I was taught, I was raised a Catholic, a Catholic and uh, Catholic as well. It's kind of an addiction, you know. Anyway, I was raised in that, and I thought I needed to know everything. The truth is, you just have to know what Jesus is saying. You have to know what Jesus is saying. If you know what Jesus is saying, you can make it through the storm. If you tell God what you're saying to him, he's going to go, it's going to get wet. I want you to hear that really closely. 
You're going to get wet if you try to tell God how you want the storm to go. But if you listen to the Lord, and you don't wake him up when he's sleeping, and you just go, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. He goes, who, who told you that? Who told you you're going to die? You're with me. You really are with him. You really are. You have to be able to listen to the Lord to know the voice of the Lord. Is that okay? I didn't mean to go on all this. I, I've been places in my life that I never would have thought I would go. Because when I got born again at 21 years old, I met Jesus personally. And I was close enough to see him up close. Like I was close enough to hug him. I was going to do that with him, but I thought I'd scare him. So, so I could reach out and hug him. But I went to hug him, and he turned big and white as the Empire State Building and glowing, like, whoa. And I knew if I touched him, I would die. And I'm just a heathen. You know what I mean? I've never heard the sinner's prayer. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what's going on, but I've got Jesus in front of me, and he's whoa, glowing. I'm going, oh, crap, there's something i got to do. And that's the true story. I mean, I was there at 21. And I said, well, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me, and I'm sorry for my sins, and help me to do better. And bang, he came back to my height, and I could hug him. And, and I literally wrapped my arms around him, and then we both went into this vision thing where he started giving me visions and he started talking to me about visions and stuff like that. The reason I'm telling you that is because with that kind of beginning in my relationship with God, I mean, I couldn't step on a bug. I mean, I was just happy. I just had a good relationship with the Lord and I was happy. I'd, I'd go around and shake people's hands and I'd say, give me your hand. And I'd say, hi, I'm born again. I have no idea what it is, but it's so cool. <laughs> you know? I mean, that was the truth about being born. I just knew that God was real, and I, knew, and I was filled with the love of God, and I loved everybody and everything, and I was just a happy idiot for Jesus. Hallelujah. And I think I've fought to preserve that. Hallelujah. I've been at this 40 years now. Had a church up in Canada, and uh, a very successful church, much like uh, Terry's or Sammy's church, very successful church, filled, filled with people that got saved by the ministry of Jesus Christ in me, filled with people, those people. I remember I went down... And this is the twist that I'm talking about, about hearing God's voice in the storm. You know I'm going to point it, right? Okay. So because the storm is God's making, it's not your making, it's not the devil's making. Oh, please understand this. The storm comes for change. That's right. And sometimes the change has nothing to do with you. And we are also me-centered about the word of God that we begin to say everything that's happening is because I'm not doing something right. In fact, one time God said to me, he said, why do you always insist on being wrong? Because I was concerned that everything in the scriptures, if, I wasn't, if there wasn't people getting raised from the dead when I walked by them, then I was doing something wrong. You know, why, why do you always insist on being wrong? Most of us in this room are doing that right now. Right now. We're doing that. We're saying to God, if I only was just a little smarter, a little better, a little taller, a little whatever, then God would you know, do this in my marriage or do that in my, with my children or do this in my finances or do this in my church. Or do, and God's not got anything to do with that. He could care less. He only loves you because you're you. He's in love with you. And sometimes the storm that comes is because he's in love with you. And you've got to accept that and surrender and say, I'm with Jesus in the boat. We're going to make it. I'm not going to panic and grab him and shake him and go, we're going to die. You're not going to die, but you might learn something. I don't like to admit, I'm not trying to point people out. I'm trying to get you to listen to the voice of the Lord in your heart. You're not far from God. None of us are. All you're born again, right? You're not far from God. God lives in you. When I come here, I look for God in you, and I'm trying to receive the God that's in you. You have a vitamin that's in you that I need. My meal is not complete unless I taste of the Christ in each one of you. I'm not satisfied unless we have fellowship. I think a lot of the churchiness in this has to die. Because we have to become people of, of the relationship. We have, to, we have to have community. We have to have real exchange so that there's real life that flows every single day. Not two events a week, one event a week. That's not Christianity. That, that's, you know, that's keeping the building going. Okay, uh, John 10, 14. And this is very short. Don't get mad at me. This is what God said to do, so I'm doing this. I didn't really plan to do anything like this, but he told me to do this, so let's do this. Let's see what he has to say. Amen. You heard this, right? You heard that the storm is God, not the devil. 
right? You heard it, right? Because I will, I will sign that if you want, because God told me that when you were up there. When you were up there, God told me that. Not all you guys praying. I, I'm glad you all praying. I'm glad you all believe, and I'm believing with you. I'm, I'm on the same heart that I'd like to see everything work out perfect. My first wife left me five times. And every time I prayed her back. And the fifth time, God's, God shouted at me. He said, stop that. And I went, what? I thought I was doing the right thing. You know, I'm always, I'm a Catholic. I'm trying to do the right thing. And I was, oh, I know how to pray. And God goes, stop that. I'm going, what? And this is 5.30 in the morning. That's pitch black at, in Canada around the cold, dark lake. And, and I go, what? And he goes, if you keep praying that way, I'm going to send her back just the way she is. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm done. It's in your hands. I quit. Because I was doing the best thing I knew how to do. And he said, stop that. Oh, Lord. I have two beautiful children from that, that marriage. She was the most wonderful woman to be married to. We fought like cat and dog during those five breakups, so it was like insanity. But she was the best woman in the whole world to be divorced from. I'm telling you. That woman treated me well. If I came and brought the kids home, like we both had joint custody, she would make dinner for me. She would say, come on in and have some dinner. She, she wasn't interested in getting back together with me. She just wanted God on her terms. God showed me once that she didn't want to accept the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was inside of her in, in, behind bars, and the, and, and the Holy Spirit was holding onto the bars going, she won't let me out. And that's the type of person she was. And that was the choices she, she made. But because she knew as a man of God, she always was good to me. Not everything that we think is the choice that God makes us. Sometimes, like when I had the big church in, up in Canada, and I call this a big church because if you get ten people, if you get two people to agree, you got something going. You got ten people to come to church, you really got something going. Because it's a higher word. You're listening to a higher word here. You're listening to truth. You're listening to non- non-Israel worship craziness. You're listening to worshiping of Jesus Christ as Lord, that everyone comes into Jesus Christ is the spiritual Israel. But the idea is that, that you've got great things going on. So that's, anyway, that's, you know, when it starts from nothing and God does it, it's just glorious. And, yes, it and that's where we're standing in the middle of, and that's what I had up there. And so then I go to, I, I went for a weekend to preach down in uh, Cartersville, Indiana. And I went for a weekend, and I had the people that I went with there go home and I stayed in Indiana for six months. I had an associate pastor. I didn't pastor alone. I always had somebody with me. Even when God told me to have a pastor church, I said, no thanks. I have no interest in being a pastor at all. The, the issue for me is just that I can't travel and play guitar and do the other things God wants me to do if I just have to you know, stay with the building. So anyway, he gave me somebody. And eventually he gave me somebody else. And this is somebody else that he told me to hire. Took my church, moved it, and pretended like I was dead. When I came back from the United States after six months, I not only didn't know where my church was, but the people loved me. I, I cried out to the Lord. Here's, I got to tell you the, I got to tell you the punchline and you're not going to listen. I, I want to, I want to make sure you don't, you don't lose the punchline. I cried out to God. I fell down on my knees and I cried out to God. And I said, Lord, if there's anything I've done wrong, let me know. Can you, can you accept that you're not doing anything wrong? Are you willing to forgive yourself enough? Are you willing to let the blood speak for you enough? Are you willing to accept that you're his righteousness in Christ? And say, okay, then why is all this going on? So I got on my knees and I cried out to God. I said, if I've done anything wrong, please, Lord, please just deal with me. Don't deal with my people. Don't deal. These are people that I was intimate with. I, you know, like I said, in coffee shops and other places, they got born again, you know, with these hands. And so it was very intimate for me, very personal. And uh, as you know, pastoring is. The Lord said, I'm not dealing with you. I'm dealing with them. And he showed me how they always wanted the church children's ministry. And they always wanted the church, all the American traditions of, I mean, sorry, all the Western traditions of church. And I had, I had no interest in any of that. <laughs> I used to tell my assistant pastor, I used to say, please start a children's program because I don't know what to do with them. I, I meant what I don't know. I, there's lots of crap I don't know. But I knew God. I knew, how to make, I knew how to make God show up in a church service because I wanted to listen to God. Oh, that's all I cared about. Hallelujah. You can comfort yourself with the Bible, but it's more important to comfort yourself that God will show up. You know what I mean? I enjoyed the worship and the, all that you all praying because God was showing up in it and God was speaking to me in it. And I enjoyed that. 
We need each other. But it's all God. He'll do with it what he wants to do with it. And when you have that heart, you'll be able to get through it. If you have another heart, what's going to happen is, is you get angry with God because he's not doing it your way, and then you think you did something wrong. And that is the beginning of defeat. When you start not focusing on who Jesus is, and you got Jesus in the boat, and you and Jesus are happy, just be happy that God is answering your prayers in ways that you don't know. I can't control everybody. I've tried. I can't. Yeah, yeah. It'd wear you out, wouldn't it? John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd... And I know my own, and my own know me. I would much rather that you know the good shepherd. I would much rather that the good shepherd has a grip on your heart and not just the words of God. Because it's easy to slide off that slippery slope into, Jesus said, you search the scriptures, and, and yet they speak of me, and you won't come to me. Sometimes we'll search the scriptures and try to find a hook that we, we can make God do something our way. <laughs> You know what I mean? Ferrari. I need a Ferrari. You know what I mean? And God's going, you know, you have a Buick, uh, the Sabre, that runs great. We're not trying to get a Ferrari, are we? We're trying to get whatever God is doing in our life. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. That case, he said, I know you, and you know me. You know that God's bragging on you today and saying, you know me. You know me. Feel the joy of that. You know me. Don't leave tonight and say, I'm a Christian because I have the word of God. Say, I'm a Christian because I know him and he knows me. Amen. What comes out of you doesn't sound like scripture, but it's scripture. Amen. Do you understand that? It's the living voice of God coming out of your life. Yes. Amen. All right. Now, let's go on to the next part. Okay. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, so he knows us the way the Father and the Son know each other. That's pretty good. We're in good, everyone happy now? You're in good shape. And I have other sheep. Holy Lord. Anyway, uh, and I have other sheep. Hold on. I know you, and you know me. Isn't that sound wonderful? And as the Father knows me, I know you, and, but I have other sheep. Because he's talking in their old covenant. He's saying, I have other sheep. We is his other sheep, right? Yes. Okay, I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. So we, we determined that we're not Jews. We're never going to be Jews. You're the spiritual Israel of God. Amen. He owns your butt. He is happy to know you. You are just as important as everybody else in the sheep fold. I'll, I'll explain that to you now. I must, okay. I must bring them also. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. Okay. So what he's saying is, I'm going to get you Gentiles to come in, and I'm going to kill you all on the cross. If you read in Galatians, it says Jesus killed both Jew and Gentile. And I'm going to make you one new man. That's what he was saying in, in little sheepy talk. That's what it is. But do you understand that he's saying to the Jews, you're not all there is. I'm sent to you. That's everything Jesus said was, was under the law, because until he died on the cross, the law was still in effect. And he was sent to the Jews, but he had a plan to bring us all into one new man. Okay, you got that? It's not so difficult? Okay. The happy thing for me about this is I don't have to learn the old covenant to be a new covenant Christian. I have to know the new covenant. I tell people that do this to me all the time, and you know, I'm a teacher. I'm a, I'm a present truth teacher, and I'm a pain in the butt teacher, okay? Because I do, not, I do not want you to live my Christianity. I want you to live your own so I can taste of Christ in you. If you don't live your own, how can I get the Christ out of you? If you're just a mirror of me, for example, which is some pastors do that, they make all, their, all the little you know, 400 people that they have mirrors of them, and they're all idiots. Don't get mad at me. It's true. You can, have, uh, you can, you know, you know, you can drown in a teaspoonful of water. You can drown in a bathtub full of water. You can drown in a swimming pool full of water. they got so much scripture they can drown, but they don't know what the point of it is. Amen. People aren't living in the present truth of God. They keep living in the scriptures. Do you know when you drove, when you learned to drive, you studied that book like a maniac for like a month or two, whatever, and then you, then you got your license to drive. Did you ever read the book again? Why? Exactly. You were driving. You were driving. All I want Christians to do is drive. I don't mind that they know the whole Bible. I just don't want it to be in their head. 
I want you to have the whole thing. He can pull out of the treasure that you put in there anytime he wants. But, but if they're not driving, you've wasted your entire life in church not driving. And some pastors, you know, that, that don't love you will keep you in a pew their, your entire life and think that's Christianity. You all come and listen to me and then you go home. That's insanity. It, if you had this, if there was a physical, physical example of what, doing it, and your fellowship hall is like that, you, you'd be sitting in a big circle. And everybody would have a chance to just say whatever God told them today. And the pastor would be the one saying, okay, thank you, that's enough, let's go on to somebody else. Because the pastor has to undergird everything and he has to turn it. The picture of a Ferris wheel, it's in, in my book, is a uh, Ferris wheel. Everybody gets a turn at the top. And the fivefold ministry, you just turn the wheel. The fivefold ministry, you're not it in a bag of chips. So because we're all in Christ. There's no difference between the Christ in him and me and you. And there's no difference. He didn't say, well, I'm going to give you a little bit and I'm going to give you a little more and I'm going to, and, and I'm going to give you Pastor Terry 99% so the rest of you have to need Pastor Terry. In fact, I bet you Pastor Terry would love it if you would bless him Amen. instead of having to suck on him all the time. And that's, a, that's the product of good teaching. Good teaching stops the wet nursing cycle and says, what is God saying to you? Who's in your boat? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. And then they called him crazy. That's what it was. They called him insane. They said, Jesus, you're insane. What kind of Jew are you talking about this sheep thing and about there's other sheep? And you got it. That's got to be the devil talk. Right? The harvest that you're in, the world you're in, everybody's a sheep. There's not one person that Jesus did not pay for. Every single person is a sheep. And until we see it that way, we're actually doing like the Pharisees go, Jesus, you're nuts. These people are whack, you know. We don't like these whack people on crack. We don't like these whack people that drive on the wrong side of the road. We don't like these whack people that can't get their act together. And I understand that, that there's serious problems. But Jesus is going, you know, so were you. I used to pray for my son, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. My son was 15 years old and lived on the streets. I have learned Christianity from the inside out because of these things. 15 years old, living on the streets in a city of 7 million people, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I prayed for him for a whole year. And I would pray, and I would cry to God for him, and I'd say, Lord, he's my son. What are you doing? And he'd go, who's his father? And I'd go, you are, Lord. Amen. That's my shut up number one. And then if I got really, you know how you get in God's face and go, you know, I'm going to pray in tongues. I can't really get in trouble because I'm praying in tongues. I really don't know what I'm saying, but I'm really just giving it to you, Lord. I'm going to give it. I'm going to make you do what I want you to do. <laughs> All right? Now, because every time we get upset, that's what we do, right? We get upset. Well, and then the Lord said to me, he said, I saved you, didn't I? <laughs> and I went, yeah, that couldn't have been easy. <laughs> it really couldn't have been easy. I had no clue what was going on when I got saved. Not a clue in the world. Do you understand that those people out there are just people that don't have a clue? He has their name written on his hands. And you were the one that he sent into that field. You're the one. You're the sheep that know him and have a relationship with him. And all you can do is testify of his love. You know that each of you is the gospel? The gospel is not a book. The gospel is not a scripture. The gospel is when you can say, I met him. He's real. When you can say, he loves you because he loves me. I know he loves you. And I'm going to tell you that an unsaved person will believe that faster than anything else. you know why? Do you know why? Because they think you're an idiot. They're convinced. If you tell somebody about Jesus, I'd like you to know Jesus, and I'd like you to know how wonderful he is and how, he, how he's touched my life and how he's changed my life, and, and I'm just, I think differently, and I'm happy, and, and they would look at you and go, what? They would go, well, if God loves him, and he's kind of special, <laughs> then perhaps he'll love me too. See what I mean? That's the little door that squeaks open is that he's an idiot, so maybe I'll give it a try. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for you know, to celebrate your love tonight. We thank you that you're <laughs> a faithful and a good God, and you've got us this far, and you will get us the rest of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. <laughs>